Okay. I think we are good to go now. Uh, sorry for uh, this little delay. We'll do our best with uh, switching windows. <laughs> I hope you can, you can follow us. OK, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, that uh, sticks with us <laughs> in the afternoon. I, I know it's going to be maybe a, li a little bit tougher <laughs> the afternoon than, than the morning. And we'll try to make, make it up with, with less lights and, and more hands-on hands -on work. So over the next. Uh, three hours or so, um, we'll, we're going to try to put what we have uh, been uh, discussing this morning in, into practice, okay? Uh, the, the, the title of this session, uh, Building an Application from Scratch, I wouldn't say it's, it's the best title. <laughs> uh, the thing is that uh, we are going to really uh, build something uh, from, a, from starting from a, from a clean AWS account but the thing is that we are going to put in practice uh, pretty much everything we've discussed in, in the morning. So we are going to be creating a serverless API uh, layer. We are going to leverage also Docker containers and, and, our, and our Elastic uh, um, EC2 container service. And we are going also to leverage the, the analytics part and, and, and we are going to be using Kinesis, Kinesis Streams, Kinesis Firefox to, to get some telemetry. So again, key takes, takeaways from, from, from this part is that, uh, again, we are, we are starting from, from a clean uh, AWS account. So the overall idea is uh, the simplicity and, 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 and how fast we can really deploy an application using our, our, our platform, our technology. Uh, you all know us already, but uh, just in case, um, we both are solutions architects for AWS Iberia. Uh, I'm David, uh, I'll be trying to do my best to, <laughs> to deliver this demo. And uh, with me, we have uh, Jesus, Jesus Catalunya, that uh, is my, my failover in case I sleep or, <laughs> or something. He's, he's my, my second availability, availability zone. Uh, and also he'll be monitoring me <laughs> to make sure that I don't, I don't uh, make any typo or, 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 or make mistakes. I'm sure I will make some, some mistakes. Uh, he'll be here to, to keep an eye on, on, on my behavior. OK, so what to expect from this session? Uh, it's it's quite, quite straightforward. We are going to build an application, but I, I have to let you know what kind of application we are going to build. Uh, so someone in, in, in the team uh, came, uh, with a, came up with a brilliant idea. Uh, so he decided to, to create kind of a Uber or Cabify application, but instead of uh, having me um, uh, ordering a, a taxi, uh, he decided that, that maybe we could bid uh, for a taxi. <laughs> so this is our application. So <laughs> it's a regular application where we are going to use uh, things like uh, geolocation positioning, all that stuff to, to detect where I am and, and, uh, and to, to look for taxis. But instead of ordering a taxi, we all can bid for the same taxi and, and, and see what happens. <laughs> Maybe some, some, of, some of us is uh, willing and able to pay, I don't know, 300% uh, instead of, uh, of, this, of, of, the, of the amount of the, of the career. OK, so again, uh, we'll try to stick to the demo uh, part, of, part of it and, and, uh, and uh, don't mess, mess it up with, uh, with a lot of slides. We need to talk a little bit about the architecture of our, of our application. Uh, so let me, let me go to the, to the picture and walk you through it. Uh, we'll have a web application, and, and the web application will be hosted uh, on, 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 a, on Docker containers. So we'll, we'll be leveraging the Docker technology that Jesus uh, mentioned and explained before. And the, the web application uh, hosted in, in, in Docker will be consuming a, an API layer, and we are going to implement the API layer uh, using a, a serverless approach with all our managed services for uh, as data stores, DynamoDB and Elasticsearch, but also Lambda and API Gateway to, to build the, the, the APIs and, 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 the, and the services. 
Uh, on top of that, we are going to be using Cognito user pools uh, to do authentication and, and registration of users, both for the, for the website but also for the API layer. That's interesting. That's uh, something that, that I think it's a, a, a key takeaway. So you can leverage Cognito both for, for user authentication on a website but also for user authentication on, a, on an API layer. And at the very bottom, uh, you know that uh, we'll have all our, our, our taxes around. Uh, we need to know their, their positioning, their location to, to understand what taxes are available and, and, and what are not. So for that, we are going to be using the, the, the streaming data part that we discussed this morning. So the taxes uh, ideally would be sending telemetry um, data using our AWS IoT cloud service. And uh, this information will be um, coming into Kinesis streams. And from that, we'll be using that, that, that information to perform different activities. On the one hand, we'll be um, informing our Elastic uh, Search um, service uh, to know where the taxes are. But we also be, will be gathering some statistics and some information that we'll be pushing, pushing to do real-time analytics. So that's. Uh, a high-level overview of the architecture of the application that we are going to try to build. And uh, let's get started. So we are going to start uh, with the, the back end. On the back end is the API layer. Uh, so we are going to, to, to build uh, the data store, uh, leveraging both DynamoDB and, and also Elasticsearch. The reason why we chose uh, Elasticsearch is uh, because we are managing this uh, geolocation information, and Elasticsearch uh, brings a lot of uh, possibilities in, in that regard. Uh, it makes it uh, very, very simple to, to perform searches uh, uh, based on, on positioning. And uh, plus DynamoDB, which is, of course, our NoSQL database and, and pretty much uh, a must when it comes to designing uh, serverless architectures. For the a API part, for the business logic part, uh, the, the business logic will be implemented as Lambda functions. And because those Lambda functions <laughs> have to be triggered uh, by, by something uh, from, from the outside, we'll be using leveraging API gateway to trigger those Lambda functions, to link uh, HTTP request, uh, RESTful requests uh, with our Lambda functions. And on top of that, uh, Cognito users pool uh, to, to implement authentication and authorization for the API layer. Okay, so let's move to our account. Okay. Uh, I, I told you that uh, we were starting uh, from, from scratch, and, and that's uh, true up to 99%. Uh, the only things that we, that we created up front, you know that, uh, that uh, AWS is uh, quite strict in terms of uh, permissions and in terms of who can do what. Uh, so we created up front a number of uh, IAM roles. Uh, I guess that you, you're all familiar with uh, our identity and access man management service. So we used it, we leveraged a, a cloud formation template uh, to create the, the IAM roles. We also created, this is the cloud formation template that we've executed, I think you can see. And uh, pretty much all that we created are IAM roles. Uh, and also we created a, a, a VPC, okay? So we are creating a VPC for our containers and, 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 and the rest of the services that will be living within this VPC. So apart from that, uh, we didn't create anything. So we are starting from, from, from <coughs> scratch, actually. OK, so going back to the slides, uh, just to sync up, uh, start, we are going to, to, to create the, the API layer. And first and foremost, we are, we are going to create the, the data stores. So the data stores are a number of DynamoDB tables and, and an Elasticsearch cluster. Let's go with it.
Okay, I have to be careful with the names that I give to my resources, otherwise the demo could fail, okay? That's the reason why I'm switching back to, the, to my script, so apologies for that. <laughs> Bear with me. Okay, so we ha we first we create the, the Elasticsearch cluster. As I mentioned, the, 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 the reason why we, we chose the Elasticsearch uh, engine is because uh, it gives a, 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 very, a very easy uh, way to provide a very easy way to to perform search geo positioning searches based on, on positioning and, and geolocation information. So to create an Elasticsearch cluster, we just need to give it a, a name and select the, the version, the Elasticsearch version that we want to deploy. Uh, as you can see over here, we now support up to uh, uh, release uh, 5.3. For this demo, uh, I'm going to stick to version 2.3 because that, that's the version <laughs> that was initially used for, the, for this demo, I don't, I, and I don't want to experiment with you now, okay? <laughs> After giving the name and, and, and selecting the, the version, uh, you know that under the hood, we are, uh, when we provision an Elasticsearch cluster, we, we really um, spin up a number of uh, instances of, of uh, virtual machines. So here we need to let the system know how many instances we want for our, for our Elasticsearch cluster and the instance type. Of course, for our demo, uh, we are okay with just uh, one instance and M4 large is uh, more than enough. Uh, we can also select the type of storage that we want for our instances. I think for, for this demo, we can uh, pretty much uh, accept all the defaults. Of course, if you have questions, please let them know, uh, uh, let me know. You can interrupt us uh, at any time uh, or during the breaks. Uh, the Elasticsearch service that we deliver uh, as, a, as a fully managed service uh, on, on the AWS platform uh, also um, needs a, a, a security policy to, to restrict the, the, the IPs or, or the, or the um, credentials or the principles that are going to be allowed to access our, our Elasticsearch cluster. For the sake of simplicity, we are going to leave it open, and I accept the risk. <laughs> but of course, you could uh, be more restrictive. So confirm and create, and uh, it'll take a, a, a few minutes. Of course, we're not going to wait for that, and in the meantime, I think we can go uh, with a different activity. So again, our data store, our backend uh, part of the, of the demo, is a, an Elasticsearch cluster but pl plus a, a bunch of uh, DynamoDB tables. So we, I think we can proceed and, 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 and create the DynamoDB table. DynamoDB, hands, hands up. Uh, who's, uh, who's familiar with DynamoDB? Okay, who's familiar with uh, NoSQL technologies? A lot more people. So DynamoDB is our NoSQL technology in, in AWS. Just as simple as that, okay? Good thing about Dynamo is that it is a, a fully managed server, a very high level managed service, meaning that uh, we just provision tables. We don't need to bother with the instances and instance types and all that fuss. Uh, we just uh, create tables and we're done. So for our demo, uh, we are going to create three different DynamoDB tables. The first of them, is for taxi config, and uh, actually this DynamoDB table, I would th I would say that this could be a, a good practice for for many for many architectures. Uh, this is not really the a data store for the application. This is just uh, holding uh, the the configuration parameters of our application. So of course your application will have uh, variables, will have a kind of environment variables uh, conf uh, configuration that that uh, may change from a, from an environment to another. And maybe a good place to store that information is a DynamoDB table. So we're going to create this table, spotaxis underscore config. And, and uh, on DynamoDB, we, it's a key value store. Uh, and for that, we need to define what our partition key is and the type of our partition key. We, can, we, we may have short keys. We may have a secondary, secondary indexes. Uh, for, for this demo, we don't need that, but uh, keep in mind that uh, it's not just a simple uh, key value store. We can have a, a more sophisticated uh, setup with, uh, again, short keys and, and, and uh, secondary indexes as well. 
If I uncheck this uh, default settings, uh, something that's uh, also important apart from the secondary indexes stuff that I've just uh, mentioned is the, the provision capacity. That's something uh, important to keep in mind when, when it comes to working with uh, DynamoDB. Um, because uh, depending on, on the throughput that we expect for, for, for our application, both uh, uh, from a read and, and from a write, write perspective, we need to provision our capacity in DynamoDB. And, and we are going to be charged uh, uh, for, the, for the capacity that, uh, that we provision. So this is uh, something to, to really look, at, look into it with, uh, with uh, the proper care and, and, and to do our math uh, appropriately, I, I would say. For, uh, in our case, of course, we are, we are okay using the default settings. But again, keep in mind that, uh, that, uh, that this is something you, you need to estimate beforehand. The, the read capacity and, and write capacity for your for your uh, DynamoDB table. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to create the other two tables. Let's start from the very last. I think it's uh, easier to, to understand. So the second table will be taxi status. And the partition key is the taxi ID. And this is going to be tracking when, when, whenever we try to order a taxi and, and create a, we are creating a bid for a taxi, this DynamoDB table is, is going to store the information uh, regarding the, the, the bids and, and, and the potential orders that, uh, that uh, are, are on, on their way. Okay, so taxi status, taxi ID is a string as well. We don't need a short key and we can accept the default. On the third table we need taxi stats We'll be using this for the last part of the, of the demo, for the analytics part of the demo. Actually using, uh, leveraging uh, the telemetry uh, the, uh, that, that the taxis are, are delivering. Plus uh, the capabilities of uh, Kinesis Analytics that we mentioned this morning, we are going to create some simple statistics and, and the, the statistics are going to be stored in, in, in this DynamoDB table. I think that, mm, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in this table we are going to be uh, storing uh, the, the number of taxes that are uh, occupied uh, over the last uh, window, 10 minutes window or something like that. So we are going to create a real-time analytics on the number of uh, taxes that are actually occupied, not free. Okay. I don't, th sorry, sorry for that. Uh, maybe it's, it's worth, uh, Giving a little <laughs> a fo a more a, big, a bigger font for, for, for the for the browser uh, for the people that uh, are behind. Okay, sorry for that. Should have been should have done it uh, at the beginning. Let's create the, the table. Okay, so we we are now in in the process of creating our Elastic Search cluster. Not yet finished and uh, our DynamoDB tables that are a, a lot faster than, than, uh, than the Elasticsearch cluster. But again, we don't need to, to, to wait. We can, uh, tables are already available. We can move forward and, and do something else. Okay, so we have our data store and uh, our data tier. So next thing is to create the logic tier, the business logic tier. And, and of course, those are going to be Lambda functions. So let's uh, try to do that. Um, some of the, of the APIs that we are going to create are going to be, are going to be secured and, and we are going to require user authentication. And for that, we are going to leverage Cognito, Cognito, Cognito user pool. So let's create our, our, uh, our user pool first. This is important. I think that um, Jesus uh, went through it this morning. But in, in just in case, uh, with Amazon Cognito, we can uh, we can manage two different things. One thing is the user is called user pool, and uh, if we select user pools, uh, actually we are uh, using Cognito as a as a identity repository. We are going to be defining and storing uh, the users within Amazon Cognito. But Amazon Amazon Cognito can also uh, instead of a just uh, working with user pools and, and working as, a, as an identity repository can 
instead uh, federate with an existing identity repository. That's an interesting. For, for this demo, we are going to use a user pool. But uh, I would say for, for real life, it's uh, far more interesting to federate uh, Amazon Cognito with uh, things like Active Directory, anything that can support uh, SAML, uh, or anything that can support uh, OpenID with Facebook, with Google, with uh, even, even our, our Amazon.com identities as well. We can federate Amazon, Amazon Cognito with that. In this case, we're going to define a, a user pool. Uh, the user pool needs to be called Spotaxi. And let's have a look at uh, what we can do with, with, uh, with user pool. Uh, every user in the user pool will have a username and a password, uh, of course. But apart from that, we can define what other attributes uh, we are going to be requiring for, um, from, our, from our, our users to be stored in, in, in the user pool, okay? So we, can, we have a, a, a number of uh, default attributes that we can select or pick up. Um, for some of them, we can also check this, uh, this mark over here, alias, meaning that uh, whenever the user is going to log in, can either use their, their username or uh, any of the attributes that are, have been marked as alias. So if we mark email as alias, the user could use an uh, email for, uh, as, as their login credentials, okay? Or the phone number or, or this thing called preferred username. For this uh, demo, we are going to just uh, select email. Apart from this bunch of uh, default attributes, we can customize uh, the, the kind of attributes that we want to collect. So you have no limits in, in that regard. We can also, because we are, we are uh, using, using user pools, and, and, and as I mentioned, this is an identity repository, we, we can uh, specify a password policy within, within uh, Cognito user pools uh, with the, the length and all that stuff. I think uh, it is clear. And this is also important. Uh, with the Cognito user pools, we, can, um, mm, we may be interested in allowing uh, self-registrations of, of the users or not. If I don't, if I don't uh, want uh, users to self-register, I would select only allow administrators to create users, and, and I would have somebody in my organization creating, creating credentials for, for, uh, for the guys that want to connect. In my case, because as Spotaxi, I want it to be something on the internet uh, publicly available, and, and I want to allow the users to register themselves, I'll stick to the default, <coughs> and, and we'll see that during the demo. We can enable multi-factor authentication. Of course, uh, we'll not be doing that in, in, the, in, in this demonstration, but uh, we, can, we can do that with Amazon Cognito. And uh, we can also require verification, uh, both using emails or, or, or phone number. In my case, I'll stick to the, to the email stuff. This is the email template uh, that you can also customize uh, for, for the user verification. Whenever I try to register myself uh, within the application, uh, I'll receive a message on, on, my, on my inbox, on the email that I've uh, specified uh, uh, when creating my account. And this is the email template that uh, I'll receive. You can customize it as well. You can tag your user pools, of course. Tagging is very, very important, <laughs> especially for uh, billing allocation purposes. And uh, because I'm going to be using this uh, user pool, uh, just uh, one step back, for both authentication, the, 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 the APIs, but also uh, authenticating users connected to the application, I need to define an, an an app client, okay? So I'll create an app client. Let me check the name, just in case I make any mistakes. Not surprisingly, it is called spa underscore taxi. <laughs> okay, I create the, the app. This is also important. Um, you can, when, when, when working with a Cognito user pools, you can customize the, the, the workflow that's uh, followed under, under the hood, meaning that uh, whenever you can define triggers. For example, uh, whenever uh, a user uh, is successfully registered and, uh, and their email is verified, you can, for example, uh, send them a, a, a welcome email with, uh, I don't know, uh, interesting links or interesting information or, or whatever, or a contract or <laughs> whatever you may think. So you can define uh, triggers and customizing that allows you, allows you to customize the, the, the workflow that is followed and under the hood. Of course, uh, each trigger is uh, associated with uh, some logic, and uh, pretty much every logic within the AWS platform is implemented as a Lambda function. 
Okay, I think uh, we're done. So I'm going to create the pool. And I'm going to take note of my pool identifier that I'll be using later on. And also I'm going to be taking note of the application ID that I created for the web application. So let's go back to the API layer. Okay, we leave our, our Cognito user pool here for later use. And uh, let's, let's go create the, the business logic. As I mentioned, the business logic is implemented as a series of uh, Lambda functions. So let's go straight to Lambda. Okay. So we have a, a, a number of uh, blueprints. I highly recommend you to have a look into these uh, blueprints uh, whenever you get started with uh, AWS Lambda because uh, many times uh, simple stuff that maybe you, you, you want to start with is already implemented, okay? So you might select, select the, 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 the runtime that you want to use and uh, the AWS console will come up with a number of uh, blueprints that you may leverage. In our case, um, we're not going to choose any of these uh, blueprints and we're going to stick to a blank function, okay? Each Lambda function is going to be, needs, needs to be triggered by, by something. So Lambda functions have triggers. Yeah? Lambda functions need to be triggered by an event. And you can see over here how many different uh, things happening uh, within the platform can, uh, can actually trigger a, a Lambda function. In our case, we're going to use an, an API uh, gateway request, so an HTTP request to trigger the Lambda function. But because we uh, have not yet created the, the, the APIs, uh, we'll leave this blank. We can do, that, uh, do this later. And uh, just go ahead with the, with the function creation. So this is important. You, you don't have to define your trigger right now. You can do that later. So this is the important stuff. The first function we are going to create is going to be called map points API. And this function, we can have a look at it. Mm, I think I have it uh, somewhere over here. This is what a Lambda function looks like. In this case, it, it, it is implemented in, in, in Python. Uh, this Lambda function is using a bunch of libraries uh, additional to, to, to just the, the, my code. So I'm importing a lot of libraries, especially the, the libraries that, that uh, interact with Elasticsearch. Because uh, this function is going to make a query against Elast Elasticsearch, uh, given my, my coordinates to understand what taxes are around me and what taxes uh, need to be um, depicted or, or pictured in, in, in the map, okay? So because of that, we are importing uh, the, a, number of, a number of external libraries to, to be able to interact with Elasticsearch, for, for example. Uh, and that answers a question that we had this morning. So can we um, import or use external libraries for our Lambda functions? Of course we can. The only difference is that uh, something that we are going, going to be doing here, the, the, the code that we need to upload to the AWS platform for our Lambda function could be just m my functions code, okay? or it could be a zip file. In the case I, that I need external libraries, I'm going to pack everything into a zip file and I'm going to upload the zip file uh, onto, the Lambda, onto the Lambda service, okay? Uh, well, we could go through the, through the body of this function, but uh, very quickly, uh, as er, all functions in this, in this demo look pretty much the same. We are going to our uh, configuration table. Remember that we created the DynamoDB config table to retrieve uh, configuration parameters, in this case, uh, the Elasticsearch cluster uh, DNS or, or, or endpoint. And then, uh, well, we have here regular Elasticsearch uh, code in, in Python to issue a, a, a query, yeah? in this particular case, to understand um, what taxes are around me in, in a 10 kilometer distance, in this case, okay? So this is implemented in Python, as you can see over here. Let's go back to my script. 
And, uh, well, if I go to here, just to give you a little bit more detail, this is the map points API function that uh, we are going to upload to the system. This lambda function.pi is, the, is the, the, the file that I just uh, showed you. And these other files and, and folders over here mm -hmm. are, are the external libraries that, that we need to, to put together with, uh, with uh, our code <laughs> for it to be executed properly. So uh, we are packaging all this stuff within a zip file this uh, map points API zip file, and this is what we need to upload to, to the platform. So instead of uh, choosing edit code, code in line, I'll select upload a zip file. Also the zip file could be stored in Amazon S3. So maybe if you're thinking uh, uh, about uh, creating a continuous delivery, continuous integration pipeline, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, you'll end up uh, putting some artifacts, for example, on an, on an S3 bucket. So you could uh, just let the system know that, that your deliverable is going to be uh, in S3 instead of, a, instead of me uploading a zip file, as I'm going to be doing right now. Uh, I need to, to select the, the runtime. Um, these are the runtimes that are currently available. We have Java, we have Node uh, 4.3 and 6.1. We have Python 2 and 3. And uh, at reInvent, we announced uh, C Sharp. This thing over here, Edge Node.js, is for something called Greengrass, uh, that is uh, in, in deploying and executing Lambda functions on uh, disconnected connected devices, on IoT devices. Uh, so for those of you that are familiar with uh, AWS IoT, uh, we understand that uh, many devices uh, maybe are not going to be connecting to the, to the cloud backbone all the time, so it's important for them to have a computing capabilities, um, storing capabilities, messaging capabilities, that's, that's Greengrass, that's a runtime that allows connected devices to, to have that uh, intelligence uh, built within. And Edge Node.js is, a, is a, what we would need to select uh, if we want to deploy Lambda functions onto uh, Greengrass. Okay, in our case, it's not Greengrass, it's just Python, <coughs> okay? And I'm going to upload the file. Sure. So, the code is the same, right? The code, sorry? The code you just uploaded is ready to go. But if you were developing that, how would that look like? So, how, how would the development environment look like? <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing it wouldn't all be in um, AWS. So, some I would develop locally, how do you manage, how do you juggle developing locally and then having the pipeline to send to the um, AWS Lambda? Yeah, thank you for, for your question. I think uh, everyone could uh, hear, hear it, right? So uh, unfortunately, we don't have a good answer for, for, for that. We are very, very, very honest. And, and the, the reality is that uh, pretty much uh, all of us uh, work in a DevOps mode, and that means that we, any, each one uh, does whatever, whatever uh, they can to, to, to manage the whole thing. So we don't provide a, a, a cloud IDE. Uh, I, I hope, I hope in, in, in a short period of time we, we could be able to provide a, a cloud IDE, but for the time being, we don't provide that. So we could leverage, we could, you could leverage your favorite IDE, and you will have to, to develop and, and test locally. Of course, testing locally is not, is not uh, that easy at, at times because uh, there's little code that lives isolated, so you'll need integrations with, uh, with uh, a lot of different pieces. For that, I would suggest uh, leveraging, for example, the, 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 the mock-up features of API Gateway. For example, uh, with API Gateway, you can uh, create a, a empty or mock-up APIs uh, so that you, you can really test locally. But again, uh, we don't have a, a complete uh, and, and smooth, uh, and, smooth and, and, and uh, simple story for that. For the time being, um, it's pretty much uh, up to you uh, to select your, your favorite IDE, your, uh, your favorite tool for, for development. There are also a number of uh, frameworks out there that uh, really help with, uh, with uh, Lambda functions and with serverless architectures. Uh, one of them is called 
the serverless framework, for example. But uh, there, are, there are a few more frameworks over there that really simplify the, what it takes to, to develop and, and to deploy Lambda, Lambda functions. But again, to make a, a long story short, it's totally up to you for the time being. Uh, and, and we can come up with some recommendations or suggestions, but uh, you can select and, and, and pick whatever you, you want. I don't know if uh, Imanol or Jesus want to find something else. Uh, no, no. Like that. So I have a, a small follow-up. Uh, I'm, I'm asking because it looked like for each Lambda function, you would have to put the whole Python environment uh, around it, it actually wouldn't need to be Python. You could have like a Lambda with Python and another Lambda with anything else, right? So testing that and developing it sounds really annoying. <laughs> uh, quite similar to something I was doing previously and it, it involved lots of weird links you wouldn't usually have to use. So. Yeah. I'll ask after the, the presentation if you have any. So it's, it's, it's the trade-off of freedom, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you can do whatever, and, and you have to deal with what you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. I was just hoping for a, um, no, no. a pleasant tip. The only, the, only, the only thing is that it, that would help, I, I understand, is to have a, a kind of a more integrated uh, experience and, and have a, a, a more integrated uh, IDE. Yep. So hopefully, hopefully we'll, have a, we'll have a cloud IDE sometime. It feels like it would push you in that direction, like as in making the development environment as similar as possible to the testing environment seems yeah. to push you in that. Okay. So that's the story. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Okay, so going back to my function, um, I hope I don't forget anything. Um, okay, so we selected the, 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 the runtime. We uploaded the function. I, I already did. Um, the Lambda functions may have uh, environment variables. Uh, that's, that's something interesting. In my case, instead of uh, using uh, environment variables, I, I'm using this DynamoDB table uh, with all the configuration. But you could leverage environment variables as well. And there's something called a uh, parameter store uh, that uh, came up uh, at reInvent uh, hand in hand with uh, our new systems management uh, capability. Uh, so you could uh, store your configuration as well in this parameter stol uh, store and reference um, uh, entries on the parameter stol store as configuration for your Lambda functions. Anyway, uh, let's go to the, <laughs> let's get to that point. I defined the, the, the zip file. And uh, uh, the zip file, of course, is a bunch of uh, stuff, as we saw before. Uh, but within, within all these files and, 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 and folders and, and whatever, um, we want to um, invoke one specific, one very specific method. Um, this method, this, me this, this function over here, Lambda Handler, that is part of uh, this Lambda function API. I don't know if uh, you in the background can, can see, but we have a file here that's called lambda function.pi and within that file we have the lambda handler. This is exactly what we need to in, in define over here, okay? Because we are providing a lot of files to the, to the lambda engine and we need to, to let the system know mm, what is the entry point for all this uh, business logic, okay? So lambda function is the, num is the name of the file and lambda handler is the name of the, of the Python function that, that needs to be triggered, okay? Of course, uh, that's totally up to you. You can change uh, the, the, the name of the files, the name of the function. In this case, it's lambda function, uh, lambda handler. And uh, pretty much as a re recurrent theme uh, within, within uh, the AWS platform, we need to give permissions to these lambda functions to do whatever. In, in particular, this lambda function is going to um, interact with DynamoDB to retrieve the, the configuration parameters. It's going to interact with the Elasticsearch service. So for that, instead of um, hard coding credentials within the, within the Lambda function, we are going to, to associate a role with the Lambda function. And that's something that we created with the, with the cloud formation template at the beginning. So we created a number of roles, uh, pretty self-explanatory for the MapPoint map API function. The role is called MapPoint API. 
I promise to go faster with the other lambda functions, but it's important to go through the details of this first lambda function. A couple of uh, very important things to, uh, to define are under this advanced settings uh, section. First one is the, the memory allocation that we are going to define for the lambda function. Um, lambda function is just a, a piece of business logic. And of course, it's going to consume memory. It's going to be allocated. Uh, it's going to be running on a, on a container. And that container is going to be allocated with, with uh, an amount of memory. So we need to define the amount of memory that our lam lambda function uh, needs. I think for this function, uh, it's 256. Sorry, 512. And uh, one very good question before it, 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 it uh, um, any, any of you mm, mm, brings it to the table is uh, how can I determine the, the, how, how much memory my function needs? Of course, you can't. <laughs> you just need to, to, to try. Eh? You just need to benchmark it. Uh, and the thing is that uh, uh, during testing, you would, uh, I would go for something a little bit higher and, uh, and uh, let the system uh, estimate or, or, or measure, better said, uh, the amount of memory that it's, it's consuming. The good thing about Lambda function is uh, that they are tightly, tightly in, totally integrated with uh, CloudWatch. And that means that all Lambda functions are, are being monitored. Uh, and part of uh, that uh, monitorization is, is that uh, each invocation of the Lambda function is going to report uh, how long it took to complete and also how much memory it, uh, it, uh, it consumed. So start with something a little bit bigger uh, or smaller. <laughs> if the Lambda function fails because it hasn't have enough memory, uh, you will see that in the logs and, and uh, with a little benchmark uh, very, very soon, you'll, you'll be able to determine how much memory it's required for your Lambda function. Another important thing, uh, because I don't know, if I don't know how, how much memory my Lambda function needs, I could go for the highest and say, let's give it uh, 1.5 gigs and, and it's okay. It's, it's uh, very seldom that my function is going to need more than 1.5 gigs. But uh, the, the, the magic is that we are, we are going to charge you for this, for this amount of memory <laughs> allocated. So it's important to stick to the, to the minimum amount that, uh, that you require for your, for your function, okay? The other thing that uh, we are going to charge you for when it comes to Lambda is the time it takes um, your, uh, your function to, to complete, okay? So we are going to be measuring the time it takes uh, for your function to, to complete rounded uh, to milliseconds, okay? So 10 milliseconds, sorry, 10 milliseconds. So we are going to charge you by, by 10 millisecond segments, okay? So if your function, uh, I don't know, takes uh, 55 milliseconds, we are going to charge you uh, 60 milliseconds. So that means that. Uh, well, that's a good question as well. So the question, the question is, uh, we are just defining a memory for, for the lambda function, uh, but how does cor um, correlate or, or is associated with a number of uh, uh, vCPUs or cores or, or, or wherever? So that's that's documented um, in our in our in our papers. Uh, I don't I don't know that by heart, but the thing is that it's a proportion. So I don't know if for uh, for 128 megs uh, I give you half a core, so to speak, or or, or one thread of a of a of a hyper thread uh, core. Uh, for for double, I'm I'm giving you double. Okay. So I think it, it is equivalent to a C4 uh, instance, something like that. But I I guess that that's going to evolve over time. So go to the docs if you don't mind, and and look for that for that ratio. Um, to have the details, but uh, again, the important the important stuff is uh, is to to size your your memory accordingly to your to your requirements. Think that you are be you're going to be using things like Node.js or Python, and it's uh, unlikely that you are that you are you are going to be I don't know starting threads like you would do. You could do that in Java, but uh, I I wouldn't recommend it at all. <laughs> But uh, I don't think that you are going to be messing around with, uh, with thread pools and things like that on, on, in Lambda function. So, so think, I think that you could, you could do the assumption that your, your, your Lambda function is going to be running on, on, on one thread and, and, and you're done. And, and uh, set the, the, the memory accordingly and, and that's it. But that's documented, okay? I don't, I, don't, I don't know the details by heart, sorry for that. 
Second thing, again, uh, we were talking about the, the, the time it takes for the lambda function to, to complete. And we are going to charge you for, for, for the amount of time as well. Uh, those are the two, the two um, metrics that we consider uh, for, for, um, to charge you for lambda functions. So that really means that lambda functions are meant to run for short periods of, per periods of time. Lambda functions are not uh, meant to be long running uh, processes, okay? And um, to protect you against that, uh, uh, we, we force you to, to define a timeout for the lambda function. The maximum timeout uh, right now is uh, five minutes. Uh, we're, not be, we're not going to be using five minutes. We are just going to specify 10 seconds, for example. So this is important as well. If you see that your lambda function fails, you have to go immedi immediately to CloudWatch logs. And the two easiest reasons to, for lambda functions to fail is because uh, uh, we had a timeout, maybe, or because we didn't have enough memory for the lambda functions to, to execute. And you're going to, to see that very clearly, very straightforward in the, in the CloudWatch logs. So that's a... Uh, that's a, an easy way to travel to. And of course, then, then you have to debug your code and all that. So that's another story. <laughs> okay. Another question that came up this morning is about the, the, the VPC stuff. So Lambda functions uh, uh, support uh, VPC uh, and, and can really live within a, within a, a VPC. As you can imagine, uh, under the curtains, uh, we have uh, something, some kind of container that is instantiated and, and that runs within, a, within a, uh, an instance. So pretty much like you would do for EC2 instances, uh, a Lambda function can be associated with a, with a network interface and, and, uh, and associated with a, with a VPC. And that would um, allow uh, that Lambda function to interact with all, all other resources that uh, may live in, in that VPC. I don't know, maybe... Uh, other EC2 instances or, or RDS instances, relational database instances, or any other uh, VPC enabled or VPC aware resource. In our case, we are going to select no VPC. Okay, so let's create the function. And for the next uh, couple of functions, uh, I'm going to be a little bit faster, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, uh, it'll take forever, <laughs> this demo. So, second function, uh, after we define the map points API, the second function is find request. It's also implemented in Python. And find request, uh, it's the entry point for ordering a taxi in our application. So whenever I click on order a taxi, we're going to invoke uh, the find request API slash function, lambda function, and it'll look for the closest available taxi around me and, uh, and start the bidding process. In this case, uh, the lambda function is what we call an inline fu inline function. So it doesn't it doesn't require uh, libraries that are not part of the of the runtime that's already included within 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 the lambda con container. This is the code for for uh, find request. Uh, pretty much the same. Uh, little um, detail uh, here actually instead of uh, interacting with uh, with uh, elastic search directly uh, this lambda function is leveraging the other lambda function so it's leveraging the, the the first api that we are going to create and that's the reason why um, instead of uh, retrieving the elastic search endpoint from the dynamodb config table we are retrieving the api gateway endpoint because again, we are reusing the first API that, that we are creating, okay? Other than that, I think we can just copy and paste it. And this would be an, an example of, a, of an inline function instead of a, of a zip, uh, zip file that, that we upload, okay? So we need to look for our entry point, the function that we really want to invoke when this uh, Lambda function is triggered, it's called find. So we'll use this over here. Instead of lambda handler, we want the system to invoke the, the find function within the lambda function file. And we need to give it permissions to do whatever. And we need to um, specify the memory settings and the timeout as well. 256 in this case. And ten, we'll say 10 seconds as well. Next. 
create function. And the third function we want to create, so first is uh, map points API to detect uh, the taxes that, taxes that are around me. Second find request to detect what is the closest taxi that is around me that's available. And the third is a bid request, which will uh, start the bidding process. Remember that instead of uh, just ordering a taxi, we all can uh, fight for the same taxi. So we are going to bid. <laughs> so the third function is uh, going to start that process. So let's go into create it. I think it's uh, also a Python function. It's called bid request. It's also an inline function. Let's go for the code. Bit request. Okay. Let's see. Okay. The entry point in this case is called bid, I think. And I have to go to, I need to define a role, permissions, and go to advanced settings, specify memory, and the timeout. Okay. And click create function. So we have now our three Lambda functions ready, ready to go. A um, lot of, uh, lot of uh, interesting things that I would like to, to comment on, but I, I don't think we have time. But as, as, uh, as uh, Jesus mentioned this morning, we, of course, we can test the Lambda functions uh, from here, but we can define different versions analysis and aliases for, for uh, our Lambda function. But this is interesting. So I could, I could have multiple versions of my Lambda function, and uh, I could define an, al an alias for, for, for each version, or for, uh, not for each version, for, for, uh, for a group of versions, uh, meaning that, um, Sorry, not for a group of version, for a version, meaning that uh, whenever a client uh, or, uh, wants to invoke this Lambda function, he could specify uh, an, an alias, and, and I internally could, uh, could route this alias to, I don't know, v2 or v1 or v3 or, or whatever. So this, this way, I can very quickly and easily switch from, uh, from uh, uh, a version that I've just deployed to a previous version in case, I don't know, I, I need to roll back. So we are managing versions and aliases. That's important. Uh, okay, we have our three, our three Lambda functions. And going back to the slides a little bit, uh, we have the data store, we have the Lambda functions, we have the Cognito user pool for, for the API authentication, and now we need to create the APIs. So let's go to it directly. Uh, and mm, the way we are going to implement APIs, of course, is uh, using uh, a serverless approach, and that means using API gateway that Jesus presented this morning. Uh, this is uh, also a, a nice feature that, that we have here. Uh, you can define APIs using the console or using the, the, the comma line interfaces or the SDKs or whatever. Uh, uh, eventually, you'll, you'll have a, an API definition. Then you can export in, in, a, in a Swagger file uh, and then import, I don't know, into a different account or a different environment or whatever. Or you could do the, the other way around. Maybe you have someone in, in your organization that, that creates the APIs using uh, their, their tool of preference. And, and then they create a, a Swagger file. And you can bring into, into AWS and, and use it to import and to create a, an API on API gateway. OK? We're not mm, going to be doing that here, because I want you to suffer and, and exp experience the, the pain of defining an API. <laughs> Uh, through the console. No, I'm, 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 I'm kidding, but I, I want you to see what it, what it really takes. Uh, eventually, uh, the, the whole idea is to get rid of all the stuff that I'm doing here right now and create a cloud formation template and, and provision everything in one step. But now uh, we are learning and we want to go through all the, th the steps. Okay. Let's go into create an API. Creating an API is just giving it, giving it a name and, and we're done. <laughs> Okay, so, so, so th this, is, this is true, of course, uh, but after we give it a name, um, we, we need to do some, some, some things. This is a RESTful API, and we are going to be 
dealing with the, the regular stuff that you would be dealing with uh, when it comes to defining a RESTful API. So the first thing we need to do is to create resources, okay? We have an, a RESTful API and we have to create resources. We're going to create a couple of resources. The first is taxi locations that we will map to our uh, map, AP, map points API function. So again, remember that we had a function that is going to locate the taxis around me and we are going to map this uh, resource to that, uh, to that Lambda function. We're going to enable course. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So we're going to create the resource. And uh, apart from the resource, we need an HTTP method to interact with this resource. So we're going to create a method for the taxi locations uh, resource. Uh, in this case, it's going to be a get method because it's, it's, it's a kind of a query. We, need to, we want to retrieve something from, from, from this resource. And our get method is going to be linked uh, with uh, the, one of our Lambda functions. So we could uh, um, integrate API Gateway with uh, pretty much anything on the AWS platform, but also outside the AWS platform. So you have this HTTP, HTTP option over here that allow you to integrate API Gateway with any API that's uh, reachable. So this could be on AWS, on Azure, <laughs> or on premises, or whatever, uh, as long as it is uh, reachable, okay? In our case, uh, we're going to link this API with a Lambda function. We need to select the region our Lambda function lives in or have been, has been defined, and uh, just select the, the, the right Lambda function map points API. Uh, with this uh, weird dialog, uh, the system is letting us know that the API gateway needs to be granted permissions to invoke the Lambda functions and if we are okay with that. Yes, we are okay with that. <laughs> but that's the, the rationale behind this uh, dialog, okay? And now uh, we have this um, resource and, and the get method and are going to do something uh, interesting, okay? which is an uh, integration request. In, in our, in our uh, API, uh, in our get API, uh, we could be receiving um, API parameters in, in different ways. We could uh, be receiving API parameters as part of uh, the um, URL uh, path, okay? Uh, or it, it could be part of the query stream, or it could be a JSON payload. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, wouldn't be that way for a get method, but, but for a post method could be a, a JSON payload or, or any other payload. So that may be uh, different from what uh, the, the function that, that sits, be, sits behind is expecting. In our case, uh, we have our Lambda function behind. Our Lambda function expects a, a JSON payload. And in this case, uh, we're going to be receiving uh, the, the, the parameters of, a, of the RESTful API as query string parameters. So with this body mapping template, uh, we are going to read uh, parameters on the query string and are going to create uh, the JSON payload that, uh, that our Lambda application ex expects, okay? So we're going to add a mapping template, application JSON, and uh, let me, in this case, please uh, copy and paste, <laughs> otherwise I'm going to make some mistakes. A uh, couple of things that I want to mention over here is that uh, mm, it's pretty self-explanatory what we are doing over here. This uh, looks like a, a JSON document uh, with, three, um, with three items, longitude, latitude, and, and a filter. And this is something that mm, resembles to, that, that we are querying the query string to, mm, to, get, to, get, uh, to get parameters on, on, on the query string. Mm, this uh, construction is based on uh, Apache VTL, Velocity Template Language, so pretty much uh, based on a standard uh, that m maybe some of you or many of you are, are used to working with, okay? So this is Apache Velocity Template Language. Okay, well, let's save it, and uh, we're done. What else we have to do here? Okay, we have created our, our first uh, resource with our first method, and now we are going to create a second resource. The second resource is, uh, is uh, the, 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 the resource we will be using to really order a taxi, find a taxi, and, and, and start the, the bidding process. It's going to be called taxes. 
have to enable course as well. And in this case, I'm going to be using not one method, but two. The first method will be a get method uh, that will be linked to the find, find taxis, find request uh, uh, lambda function. And this, uh, this uh, get method over the taxis resource uh, will be the one that selects the taxi that's available and, and closest to my location and retrieve that taxi uh, to start the bidding process. So, and the function, same region, and uh, find request. Yes. And I also have to convert uh, or to translate from the query uh, from the parameters on the on the query string to a JSON payload to the kind of JSON payload that my lambda function is is expecting. Okay. Second method is a post method, and this will really uh, make a bid. So in this case, I'm going to submit uh, how much money I'm, I'm uh, willing to pay for, for a taxi. So, so it is an update action. And for that, I'm going to, to use a, a post method for the, request, for, the, for the REST API. Same thing, it's going to be linked to the Lambda function. And in this case, the Lambda function is HTTP REST. I need also to convert from parameters uh, in the query string to a JSON payload. So I'll go to body mapping template. I'll, I'll add a mapping application JSON and copy and paste the mapping from my script. Again, I think it's uh, pretty much uh, self-explanatory. Okay, we're done. Uh, last thing that, uh, that uh, we, we not need but want to do is, uh, has to do with, with security. So before we deploy the API, I think that before we, yeah, before we deploy the API, uh, we want to work with security. So I have two resources, uh, taxi locations and, and taxis. We want to leave the first one, taxi locations, uh, insecure. So we want to allow anyone, so to speak, to get the, 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 the taxis available uh, surrounding a, a, a given location. But of course, for, for the ordering process, for the bidding process, we want to protect uh, the, the, the API. So that all methods uh, below uh, taxis resources, uh, we want them to be, to be secured and, and protected. So that mm, brings us to, to Cognito and to the Cognito staff that, uh, that we mentioned at the beginning. We're going to create an authorizer. Good thing about API Gateway is that it is uh, natively integrated with uh, Cognito user pools uh, and that simplifies uh, a lot to, to implement security for, for your APIs. But you can uh, always uh, select a custom authorizer. And a custom authorizer um, is going to be, needs to be defined in the form of a lambda function as well. But that brings you, um, that opens the whole picture for you. Because uh, within lambda, fu lambda function, you could implement any, any, any authentication and authorization mechanism you may think of, okay? So this is totally open. You can integrate your, your API security with, with any um, security model that you may have in, within your organization. In our case, again, to simplify the things and, and to leverage the AWS platform, we're going to use uh, the Cognito user pool that we, we created uh, at the beginning. So I select the region, Ireland, and the, and the Cognito user pool, and, and that's it, we're done. We don't need to do anything else. We have the authorizer, okay. We, we may define as many authorizers as we want for, for this uh, API. Uh, we, don't need, uh, we only need just one over here. And now we have to um, associate uh, each protected method with the proper authorizer. So I want to protect the get and post methods under, under the taxes resource using this uh, Cognito user pools. So I'll go to method request uh, and I'll change the authorization from none 
to the uh, Cognito user pool authorizer that I've just associated with these API. Okay, same thing for, for, for the post uh, method. And now I believe we are ready to deploy the API. Let me check in case. Uh, one, there, there's one, one more thing missing that's important, and that's enabling, enabling course. Okay, because uh, we are going to invoke uh, this RESTful API from a web application, and the web application is going to be hosted on a, on a domain different than, than the domain of the RESTful API. We need to enable course and uh, be a little bit aware of, a, of, a, of a how we configure cores. So for this uh, taxi locations resource, we are just okay with all the defaults. But for the taxis resource, because these resources are protected, uh, we are going to be using one extra HTTP header, which is user ID, and we need to make sure that this uh, HTTP header is uh, <coughs> propagated. Looks good. <laughs> okay, now we are ready to deploy the API, and that's, uh, that's also uh, something that I want to, to bring your attention to. When we deploy an API, so, so far uh, our API is defined and constructed, but it's not accessible. So when, when it will become accessible when we deploy it. Uh, when we deploy it, actually the, the, the system is going to, to create a URL, an accessible URL for us to interact with our API. And uh, in, a, in, a, in a similar way uh, as we dealt with um, uh, versions on, on AWS Lambda, we can deal here with uh, what, what are called deployment stages, okay? So we can deploy our API to different deployment stages. Uh, this, in, in, in most, most of the times, have to do with uh, uh, environment, deployment environment. So we, we could deploy to dev the environment, to Q&A environment, to production environment, to pre-prod environment, wherever. But you could use that in, in, in any other way that you may, may imagine. In, in my case, I'm going to define a production uh, stage and deploy my, my API. And uh, as soon as I deploy my API, uh, the system gives me uh, an endpoint, gives me, gives me a, a complete URL that I'm going to, to copy and uh, that I'll, I'll be using then to interact with, uh, with the APIs. Let me take note of this. Okay. So you have now to believe me <laughs> that, that, we have <laughs> that we have already implemented uh, all these parts in, in the picture, okay? So we have all the backend APIs, we have the data tier with the DynamoDB and Elasticsearch, the Lambda functions that implement the, the business logic and the API, the RESTful APIs uh, that will give uh, the, the website access to the, to the Lambda functions plus the Cognito user pool that uh, will allow us to have uh, our, our APIs, our resources secure. So let's move on uh, to, the, to the next part. And the next part is the, the, the web apl application itself. So we kind of uh, created the back end and we have to create a front end. And uh, to, to play a little bit with the, with the platform and, and, and uh, to show something different, in this case, uh, the website is going to be implemented not as a serverless application. We could have done that. <laughs> but in this case, um, it's going to be implemented uh, using containers, okay? Using, uh, using uh, Docker containers and using uh, uh, EC2 container service and EC2 container registry to manage and, and to deal with, this, uh, with these containers. Um, actually, uh, our website will, will, look some, will look like this, and uh, whenever we start a, a, a bid for, for a taxi, um, because this is a collaborative process, so some, some of you m may try to fight for the same taxi and, 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 and 
submit a, a, a bigger bid for the same taxi. I want to be informed if, if someone else is, is uh, making a, a, a bid higher than mine. And for that reason, we are going to implement that, that uh, feedback using, using WebSockets. Okay? So actually, our web application is going to be made up of two parts or two pieces, two, two sets of containers. On the one hand, we have the, the website itself with the HTML pages and, and the JavaScript code and all that stuff. And on the other hand, uh, we will have a, a bunch of containers that will be implementing the, the WebSockets uh, layer that uh, will provide this, this feedback to the, to, the, to the web application. So I'll be creating a couple of uh, different uh, Docker images, one for the website and one for the, for the WebSocket layer. And in front of them, uh, because we want our system to be highly available and uh, we want our system uh, to load balance the, the, the load um, across uh, multiple instances of our, my, my Docker images, we will be using a, a load balancer, of course, an application load balancer. That's pretty much the, the, the architecture. So the load balancer in front, um, the two sets of containers for the web application and the web sockets layer, and of course that, that will interact with, uh, actually with the API. So this, this uh, uh, arrow over here is not, uh, it's not uh, so precise because uh, actually this, this, this thing will, will be interacting directly with, with the APIs we just created. So let's go for it. Okay. Uh, I don't know how, how we are doing with, uh, with time. Uh, I don't know if, if it is time for a break or just, just let me know. Whenever we need to break. <laughs> I'm okay, but I, I understand that uh, this is a little bit tough for, <laughs> for the audience or might maybe a little bit tough for the audience. Okay, so um, again, uh, because this is uh, going to be based on, on containers and, uh, and container images, first thing we need to do is to, to create a, a, an EC2 container service cluster. And what is a, a container service cluster? Okay, it's just a name, <laughs> as usual. Okay, so this is important. So uh, Jesus uh, went through 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 this uh, in, in in the morning, but uh, I want uh, I want uh, to remind you uh, about about this. We when 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 it comes to creating a, an ECS cluster, an Elastic uh, and an EC2 container service cluster, we can do several different things. So for for example, uh, we could come up with uh, I don't know. Just, uh, just associating in a, in a, in a, um, uh, I would say, rigid way, mm, the, the, the instances, the EC2 instances that are going to be part of this uh, ECS cluster, that would be on-demand instances. And of course, if we do, if we do that, we need to let the system know how many instances we want, uh, what instance type uh, we want to use, and all that stuff. We need to configure uh, the, the, the instances that are going to be part of the cluster. That would would not be as dynamic as uh, as I would like personally. So uh, a better approach, uh, instead of uh, saying on-demand instances, is a uh, working with spot fleets or spot instances, okay? This is uh, interesting because when it comes uh, to Docker images and, and to containers, a couple of things. Um, first thing is that, uh, that uh, our applications, our, our images have to be, this is a must, absolutely stateless, meaning that uh, we can restart, we can uh, uh, have them recycled at, at any time. So if that's true, we really don't mind uh, what the system does with our images. So as long as we have, I don't know, three images with this capacity to, to be able to cope with the load, we're okay. So if that's the case, we can leverage spot fleets uh, and, and let uh, under the hood AWS to provide us the cheapest machine uh, that, uh, that brings us the, the, the capacity that, that, that we need. Let's imagine that I, ha I want to create a, a, um, an ECS cluster with, I don't know, uh, one terabyte me memory and uh, uh, 128 uh, V CPUs. This is what I need. I need that, that capacity, but I don't care if uh, the system provides uh, 
an R3 instance uh, uh, plus a C4 uh, machine plus uh, whatever. Sorry? Okay. So I, I really don't care about, about the, the combination that the, that the AWS systems com, comes up with. Uh, what I want is to minimize the cost. Uh, I don't know if, 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 if that's something that, that, that is clear, but working with spot instances is really powerful when, uh, when it comes to, to containers. Because again, we want a combination of, uh, of uh, machines. I don't, I don't care what types of machines that bring, bring me uh, the, the right capacity that, 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 that I need and that I can run uh, my containers of, uh, on top of that. So instead of going for on-demand instances, let's go for a, for a spot page. It's, it's a really a recommendation and really a best practice uh, uh, when, when, when it comes to working with containers. Of course, your containers need to be resilient and, and, and need to be completely stateless. Otherwise, you're gonna be uh, running into, into problems. And the third thing that we could do, instead of uh, defining on-demand instances or spot fleets or, or wherever, is really um, leverage the, the auto-scaling groups that uh, I think uh, Jesus mentioned uh, this morning. I guess that you are, uh, you're all aware of uh, our EC2 service and, and our VMs and all that stuff. And on top of our EC2 service, uh, you, uh, you're also aware of something called auto-scalability group. So instead of defining a, a machine, uh, we define a, a configuration and, and on top of that, an auto scalability group that uh, will take care of uh, defining <coughs> and understanding how many instances of that type uh, need, need to be launched. So that's also a good approach for, for, uh, for ECS clusters because we, want, uh, we don't want to, to bother with, uh, with uh, the cluster scalability. I think that that's, this is something that was mentioned this, this morning in, 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 in one question you, you asked. Uh, we really prefer to do things in an automatic way. So if I, have a, if I am um, running a, many more containers that, uh, that the initial capacity that I was uh, provisioning, uh, I can leverage the auto, -scale, the, the auto scaling groups and let this, the system understand uh, and, and alarms that, that, are, and that are set, set up in, in, in the system and, and uh, I don't know, provision more instances if, if needed. So this is what we are going to do here. We are going to create an empty cluster. Okay. If we go back to clusters, uh, I have my Espo taxi and it says that uh, it doesn't have any, any instance uh, now, now available. So I, now I, 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 I am going to to give some, some resources to my cluster, otherwise I won't be able to uh, uh, spin up any, any images. But for that, again, instead of uh, creating a, a, an on-demand instance statically, I'm going to leverage auto, an auto-scaling group. And an auto-scaling auto group, uh, it's a, a combination uh, of, a, of, a, of a configuration that defines what type of instance I'm going to spin up and uh, a policy that, that uh, the system uses to determine how many instances of that type uh, have to be spun up. So I need to create a launch, a launch configuration. A launch configuration is uh, the way we tell the system what type of instances uh, we want it to, to spin up whenever uh, the capacity requires it. And it's always the same. I need to define a base image for, for my launch configuration. I'm going to define a T2 medium for this demo. I'm going to give it a name, the launch conf configuration. Sorry, I clicked on the wrong link. This is uh, important. Uh, the instances uh, um, that are part of the cluster need to interact with the, with the EC2 container service. Okay, so the instances need to need things like uh, mm, say, hello, I'm here, uh, I want to be part of this cluster. Uh, the instance needs to, um, for example, uh, retrieve Docker images from, from the Docker registry. 
So the instance uh, needs, to, needs to be granted permissions to interact with the EC2 uh, container, container service and EC2 container registry. And this is done as usual through a, a, an instance role, okay? So this is what I'm doing here. I'm defining an instance role. I think it's ECS, correct, thank you. And uh, I need to specify advanced details. Mm. More specifically, um, whenever this instance uh, is created, uh, the way, uh, there, are, there are different ways, but one way for this instance to understand what, what is um, its uh, parent ECS cluster is to use a, an environment variable, okay? It's to use a, a, an environment vari variable that populates this um, ECS, ecs.config file. So here, with this uh, little script over here, uh, whenever this one instance is created, um, I'm creating this ECS cluster uh, environment variable and I'm putting uh, the, uh, this ECS cluster as well as variable into this file, ecs.config. And then the ECS agent uh, will read this file and uh, interact with uh, EC2 container service and uh, will say, hello, I'm a machine and I want to be part of uh, the ESPO taxi cluster. Okay. Storage is, is uh, more than enough what we have over here. And then I need to specify security group. Um, actually, uh, I'm not going to be SSHing into these machines. So, mm, it could be, it, 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 uh, it could seem that, that I don't need uh, any, any, any rule in, in, uh, in, this, in this security group for, for this uh, group of machines. But the reality is that uh, this group of machines, of instances, are going to be fronted by, by the load balancer, okay? So the only rule that I need in, 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 in this security group is the one that, that specifies that the load balancer is going to be allowed to, to interact and to send traffic, to send requests to the underlying uh, EC2 instances, okay? So for that, I'm going to use uh, this uh, Spotaxi role security group over here with this rule uh, that you can see at the bottom. Uh, one interesting fact uh, or one thing that, that I would like to, to bring your attention to is, th is this port range over here. And uh, this has to do with containers and, and with Docker images. Uh, you know that uh, Docker images live within a, within a machine, within a VM. Um, and uh, actually the, the, the host VM um, is going to, to breach or, or is going to, to use an overlay network so maybe your Docker image is uh, listening on port 80 or listening on port 443. But uh, if I spin up uh, multiple images of the same, multiple containers from the same image within the same uh, host VM, uh, those ports are, are going to collide. So the way uh, Docker uh, solves that is by breaching the network, creating an, an overlay network. And uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the host VM, uh, actually, um, Docker is going to reserve uh, a, an, an unused port for the underlying container. So it's going to, again, create a bridge network and, and maybe say for, for this uh, container that's listening on port, theoretically on port 80, from their perspective, I'm going to reserve port, uh, I don't know, 5,000, 5, for example. So that long story to, to explain that we don't know um, beforehand, we don't know up front what ports we, we need to open from, from the load balancer. So we need to come up with a, with a huge range of ports, with the, with the range of ports that the, the Docker engine mm, may use, okay? So I think we are done. Okay, so we define the, the launch configuration and remember that we are creating an auto-scaling group. The auto-scaling group needs a, a, a launch configuration to, to know what type of instances uh, it needs to create. And then a, a policy, a kind of policy that, that defines how many instances uh, it is going to create. Uh, uh, we also need to, to mm, tell this auto-scaling group where 
uh, it can spin up uh, new instances. In this case, we are going to select the, the private VPC, the specific, the specific VPC that we created for Spotaxi. This VPC has a couple of subnets. Uh, we want to leverage uh, the two subnets to have the service as highly available as possible using all, in, in this case, two different a ACs. Uh, availability, zo availability zone, sorry for that. Uh, I need to give it a name as well. I think it's not relevant, the name I give it, but uh, let me copy and paste in just in case. And this is uh, important as well. Uh, here, for the sake of simplicity, I, I, tell, I told this uh, auto scalability group to start with two instances. And I'm going to mm, keep this number fixed. So this auto scaling group is, is going to make sure that I, I always have a, at least uh, two instances of, of, uh, of machines, two, two machines uh, being part of, uh, of the ECS cluster. But instead, I could use uh, auto scaling policies, as uh, Jesus mentioned during uh, his presentation. Leveraging alarms uh, like, uh, for example, the memory utilization. I think that that's the, the proper metric that, uh, that, that should be used to, to trigger alarms and, and to trigger our scaling. So again, if I spin up, uh, rem remember that we have um, one extra layer when, when, when working with the containers. We, we have the, the Docker layer with the, with the Docker uh, containers. And then we have the VMs layer, okay? So we, we may need to scale both. We may need to, to, bring, to bring up more containers to deal, to, to deal with, uh, with throughput and, and, and with capacity. But if we spin up uh, too, much con too many containers, we may need to scale the, the, the underlying infrastructure. These uh, policies would, would take care of that, okay? It would take care of scaling not the container layer, but the, 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 underlying, the, the underlying infrastructure that, that's really the foundation on, on, or, or where those containers are, are living. In my case, again, keep this simple. Mm, stick to the, to the size of the two machines that I've just uh, configured. And I'm going to define a tag that will help me identify the instances that this auto scaling group creates. Okay, I think we are okay. As soon as I hit the create auto scaling group, uh, first, uh, the system is going to create uh, the, uh, the auto scaling, the launch configuration, all that stuff, as you can see over here. But because, uh, because uh, the auto scaling group, we, we told the auto scaling group that we wanted to, to make sure that we always have two instances, the auto scaling group immediately is going to start creating those, those two instances. And I hope if everything works okay, we'll see two instances creating over here. These are in the process of, of being initialized. So first, uh, those will be initialized, and uh, when its initialization finishes, and, and the EC2 container service agent starts and, and reads the file that we created before, um, those will come up as, uh, as uh, part of our Spotaxi cluster. So this will happen in, in just a few seconds, but I think it's a good time uh, for, for a break for a coffee break. Thank you for your patience. I hope you'll, you'll, you'll be finding this a little bit interesting. And uh, I'll open to, to, I'm open to questions uh, during the coffee break as well. So I see you in. Uh, yeah, uh, 30 minutes. We can come back in 30 minutes. So coffee break upstairs. Okay, thank you. Thank you.